Hey everybody, welcome to BFR 101. My name is Ed LaCara. I am the uh, Director of Education for Smart Tools Plus. And I'm um, just gonna wait a few more minutes here and uh, let other people jump on. We're starting to see people come on here. <clears throat> So open up your chat, because that'll be the best place for you to be able to ask questions. Why don't you just go in there and respond, just say hi, and just make sure everybody can see it. Pump for this, no pun intended. I love that, Matt, right? Very nice. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, we got some people raising their hands. I don't know exactly what that means. Um, yeah, I don't know what that means either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that means I might have a question. Yeah, it was in the Q and A, so it popped up in the Q and A. Hmm. All right, cool. Oh, will you keep track of those for me, so because um, I'm not going to focus on the chat. You just sure let me know if I have something that comes up, and then that way I can answer. Especially if it's pertinent to right then, I might push it to the end if it's something um, that's <clears throat> not a great time for it, but. I want to make sure I answer everybody's questions. And I'm going to take some notes too and make sure that I get everything. All right, what are we up to? 160? I know I'm, I'm always late for webinars. Like it never, it never ceases to amaze me how long it takes me to, to log into the technology. So we'll give people a few more minutes. We had all 500 registered, so that's pretty amazing. Darcy, you're right. You're you're welcome. Happy to. From from Slovenia, Anissa, nice. Athens, Greece. Hi, hi, Demetrius. And Illinois. <laughs> and Illinois, Calgary, Alberta. Love that place. Saudi Arabia, Guadalajara, Edmonton. Lots of good hockey and lacrosse uh, representatives here. Spain, Cleveland, Ohio, right around our HQ. Checking go. in from Minnesota, nice. Matt Wright, um, I don't know, 60 to 90 minutes or so. I mean, just depends on questions, but you know, we're gonna send out a replay to everybody afterwards. Um, and so even if you have to take off, um, no worries. We'll make sure that you have access to everything. And then, um, I tried to make that workbook yesterday as kind of as comprehensive as I could. I mean, you'll take notes and things in it as well. Um, but, uh, that should give you a lot of good feedback as well. Um, Italy in the house. All right, San Jose Earthquakes, that's my, uh, that's my hometown right around there. Nice to see NorCal represented. Matt Wright, where can we find the workbook? I emailed that out to everybody yesterday, probably about 6 p.m. Central Time. If you did not receive the workbook, which, um, uh, let's see, what's the best way, Nick, for you? Can you send them a workbook if they didn't receive it yesterday? Because uh, I didn't see any bounces. I don't know if I have their emails. Um... We can send it to him after, for sure. For whatever reason, we can't. Oh, Matt Wright found it. BFR 101 tomorrow. Got yep, it. there we go. Oh, thanks, Matt. You can put that link in there. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's a great idea for anything. We were trying to wonder how to share docs. And um, Is it in Google Drive, eh? I have it in Dropbox. Okay. So, um... So that's a great way to share docs without sharing. Oh, good, nice work, man. That's awesome, okay. Checking in from Garland, oh, right around the corner from me right now. All right, people still popping on. Let's go one, one or two more minutes. All right, my first question for everybody is, is how many people have not gotten dressed, like literally in the last week? Like today I put on a polo and I was like, oh my God, I'm actually, Digging into my non-workout gear. You can always pin the Dropbox link within the chat. Love it. Thank you, Demetrius. Demetrius. 
Gym clothes only, right, Ryan? My name's Ed LaCara. I'm um, the director of education for Smart Tools and um, Smart Cuffs. I um, really, I mean, I'm like really flattered. So many people will jump on here to get this information. Sometimes I've been teaching this stuff since about 2015, 2016. And so I start to um, forget that there's still a lot of people that don't even know about BFR or still interested in a lot of the programming and things. So um, I was really excited yesterday putting all this together. Um, and it really makes me think like, okay, what's the best way to present this information? Because it is, you know, new and, and really, really cutting edge stuff. It's only been around for a little bit, which I'll get to in the US especially. But um, <laughs> I mostly wear BFR cuffs and nothing else. That's it's very impressive. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, and now what you should be able to see is my PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to uh, start. And um, in addition, you should see the, uh, the workbook that I put together yesterday. So everybody should have received this workbook and my friend posted this as a Dropbox link if you did not, uh, but this will be kind of your resource in conjunction with, um, with what I do. And if you like what I do today, we ran out of room. And so we opened up a second one for tomorrow. So if you know anybody that wanted to jump on and they couldn't, or they couldn't get the replay, um, we've been broadcasting and maybe we'll put that into a link for tomorrow's, um, tomorrow's BFR 101 training. And of course, if you want to jump on again, because you think you'll get more information tomorrow, then come on in again. We have some openings still. I think we're only at about 300 or so right now. Yeah, I think tomorrow. we got about a hundred more. Oh, okay. So we have about a hundred left yeah. uh, before we're sold out, sold out. It's a free training uh, before we're expired out of, uh, out of seats. So, all right. So like I said, my name is Ed LaCara. I've been in practice for about 20 years. Uh, my background is strength and conditioning. I'm a chiropractor. My PhD is in sports medicine. I have an MBA in trans global education. I'm also an athletic trainer. And a, uh, like I said, a strength coach, uh, my contact information is right there. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Um, either send me an email. Honestly, emails get buried a lot. So if you shoot me a, a message on social media, that's usually the best, either in um, Instagram um, and then in Facebook on my business page, Ed LaCara, I just have it under PhD. Um, currently, I'm board certified in sports medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, I'm writing a blood flow restriction book, which should be finished hopefully this year. It's been, um, it's been crazy. I've been working on it for about three years. Um, I own a private practice and that's where I am right now in Dallas, Texas, where I use BFR pretty much um, probably about 80% of my patients, not everybody, which I'll talk about a little bit why I don't with some, um, but for the most part, anytime that I need strength and conditioning, strengthening of tissue, I uh, will use BFR. Um, I'm a master instructor for TRX. I've done some programming and things for them as well. I used to be the former director of education for Rock Tape and a former VP of sports science and human performance at 24 Hour Fitness. I teach a master's level uh, soft tissue rehabilitation course. Um, and I'm also starting a lifetime fitness uh, course for Parker University. Um, that'll start sometime, I think, in uh, May, which I'm pretty excited about just teaching about, hey, what's the importance of exercise as a lifetime habit for health. So let's first talk about blood flow restriction training and where it fits into the paradigm. Uh, BFR is really, well, I should back up. Exercise is really an important part of a healthy lifestyle. I don't think you'd be on this webinar if you didn't think that that was true. Uh, we use exercise to help overcome injuries and recover from surgeries. And we're always looking for ways to efficiently maximize the benefits. In about 2007 or eight, uh, one of my um, coursework professors, Kyle Kiesel from the Selective Functional Movement Assessment said something to me that was really, really profound. And what he said was, hey, most of you guys that are doing rehab in your clinic are not doing what you think you're doing. And of course, you know, the hairs on the back of my, on, the, on my back stand up and I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, and, and, and Kyle Kiesel is a big deal. He's a, a PhD PT. Um, he wrote and developed the Selective Functional Movement Assessment, and I have a lot, a lot of respect for him. So when he said that, it kind of hurt my feelings, actually. I was kind of butthurt. 
but it, what he meant from that was that when we do what we're ta- when we do what we're taught in the clinic using light loads, using uh, body weight exercises, we're not actually doing strengthening and creating increases in size in tissue. And that really, really hit home to me like, wow, I don't have enough time with somebody. I don't have the space. People run out of insurance. There's not enough. I don't have enough weight in my clinic in order to cause true strength and hypertrophy changes. Those usually take somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks. They take heavy loads between 65 and 90% of your one rep max. And most of my patients are injured. And so I don't get a chance to actually do that with them because by the time they're out of pain and I've moved them down the line a little bit, they're typically going back to their strength coach. They're going back to their personal trainer. They're going back to their CrossFit gym. And so I started doing more movement-based assessment and corrective exercise because I was like, well, I might as well correct exercise in the four to six weeks that I see somebody typically versus try to pretend like I'm doing strength and conditioning. And the reason I tell you the story is because that's really why I got so excited about blood flow restriction training because what I was able to do then is get back to my roots of strength and conditioning, start to cause strength and hypertrophy in a third of the time, meaning like two to four weeks, and really start to cause change. And so that's why I got so excited about introducing blood flow restriction training to my patients and my clients that are looking for a healthier lifestyle. So what is it? And really what I'm gonna talk about today is you know, kind of what it is, who uses it, how we use it. I don't really have enough time to go into a ton of programming. There's a lot of other options that we have. We have live courses. Well, not live right now with what's going on, but they'll come back soon, probably hopefully in May. We have online courses. Um, We have a lot of options for how to learn. I do a Tuesday webinar and I'll send out a link to everybody every Tuesday, uh, uh, one o'clock central time. I either look at some new research. I look at some programming. I look at a patient that came in that I applied BFR with um, and I just kind of share that as a lunch and learn. And it's like, you know, only about 15 minutes because that's usually time between patients and it's part of my lunch. But, um, but lots of options to learn a lot about BFR. So what is blood flow restriction training? Because I feel like there's a lot of misconception out there about exactly what it is. So BFR is the brief and intermittent occlusion of both arterial and venous blood flow using a tourniquet or tourniquets while exercising at low intensities, something between 20 to 35% of one's one rep max. And 20 to 35% one rep max is the definition of low intensity resistance training. Moderate level, moderate intensity resistance training is 35 to 65% of one's one rep max, and 65 to 90% of one's one rep max is the definition of high intensity resistance training. So what I was taught 25 years ago as an exercise physiology undergrad was that in order to cause change in tissue, in order to create size, in order to create strength, we had to train at high intensities. But not everybody can train at high intensities if you are injured, you have pre-existing conditions, possibly if you're elderly, um, lots of reasons why people can't lift at heavy loads because they don't want to hurt themselves. And this is the way to get people to use light loads yet get adaptations of high intensity training. So in your manual, what I did was, um, you don't have to read all this right now, you can always read it later. I put in a lot of links. So I put in these links in blue that have direct links to either previous videos that I've done or my social media where I do a lot of stuff. Um, And so you can look at any of these things to link. So if you're, if you have this printed out, I want you to kind of look at these questions and say, Hey, can I answer these questions? So instead of doing like objectives for the course, which nobody ever looks at anyway, it's really like, can I answer these questions by the time that I'm done with this course? And if you can't, then I want you to come back to me and say, hey, I couldn't answer those questions. And then I'll do a better job of explaining because it's my fault that I'm not conveying the information. So the first question that I'm asking you is, in your own words, what is blood flow restriction training? And the reason I want you to write this out is because people are going to ask you about it. If you start putting cuffs on and go to the gym, 
or you start using it with your patients or your clients, or you using it for telemedicine, people are going to say like, why would I use this? Like, why, why do it? And so it's nice to write stuff out because it can make you really have your message super confined. This is my message. It's the brief and intermittent occlusion of both arterial and venous blood flow using a tourniquet while exercising at low intensities. The other things that I want you to answer at some point, you might not be able to answer this question now, but hopefully you'll be able to answer it by the time that we're done. You know, what are some of the benefits of using BFR and um, kind of where did it originate? Because these are all questions that I get in the clinic from patients every day. So other names for BFR could be katsu, could be occlusion training. Um, people just use BFR specifically. I tend to use BFRT because it includes the training component. Delphi is used a lot. Delphi is a manufacturer of a tourniquet. Uh, they're based out of Canada. They have an awesome BFR system. B Strong is another system that's out there. You'll hear terms about, and you know, there's many, many more, and we're going to expect to see more and more people come out with uh, different types of of cuffs and tourniquets. And, um, and so what I'm taking today is an approach from my overall view. And I'm not, I'm trying to take it not from, um, you know, not from like, Hey, it's gotta be done exactly one way. Cause we know that there's multiple ways to do things. You know, Henry Ford once said that all models are wrong. Some are better than others. And if the guy that invented the car and manufactured the car and really invented and to develop, you know, manufacturing lines and really change the way that we do business in business in the United States can understand that. Then I know what I teach is hopefully as up to date as possible, as evidence based as possible is utilizing my experience, both personally and with patients and also involves the patient or the client. Cause there's some people that just, this is a little uncomfortable for them and they don't really want to use BFR training. And I have to respect that. And so if you remember evidence-based or evidence-informed, the evidence-informed model, according to Sackett, is a three-pronged approach. It's the best available scientific evidence. It is clinical experience, and it's also patients' wants and expectations. So we always want to keep that into consideration anytime that we're using any type of modality. So what is BFR used for? And no, this is not me. Um, we use it to increase muscle strength. And typically we can start to see increases in muscle strength in about three to four weeks or so. Increased muscle size. Muscle size with BFR compared to non-BFR is much faster. We'll see changes in muscle size within about two weeks. This typically would take somewhere between 14 and 16 weeks under normal training circumstances. And we can also increase cardiovascular function, which I think a lot of people don't really know about is that we can use this with a simple walk, which typically would not be effective in increasing my physiological capacity, but it can increase VO2 in as little as six weeks. So I'm gonna kind of show you some programming around that. When do we use it? When heavy loads cannot be tolerated. When are those cases? Rehab, in season, um, can be used with the elderly that can't lift heavy loads. And it can also supplement existing fitness programs. We have some evidence that demonstrates that if I combine BFR, like let's say I want to improve my bench press, I'm going to go for the NFL combine and I got to make sure my NFL bench, my combine bench press is really, really good. If I do training typically two days a week for bench press and I add BFR as a third training session, I get better, better increases than if I do that solely um, under high intensity, that 65 to 90% one rep max. So some of this programming will be in my level two course that's hopefully gonna come out in the next you know, month or two, um, which is going to be all non-rehab. It's all gonna be, you know, how do I use it pre-exercise? How do I use it post-exercise for recovery? How do I use it in season? How do I use it as preseason training to get somebody ready? How do I use it in order to get somebody ready to train for the Boston Marathon? I'm so sorry for those of you that qualified. I had so many patients qualify for the Boston Marathon that got canceled. I'm so sad for them um, with the current environment. So supplementing existing fitness programs is a huge, is a huge benefit with BFR. Again, the benefits of BFR, use lighter loads and get similar results as higher load training you get little to no muscle damage as long as we don't take the exercise to failure. And so I'm gonna show you what that means. 
and we get much faster results than normal training for both aerobic and resistance training with less intensity, less resistance, less um, intensity on a bike or a treadmill. I think I got some questions, so let me see what's going on here. What is the post-workout effect compared with post-heavy load workout? Um, what is the post-workout effect? Post-workout effect compared with heavy load workout? Okay, I think I understand. It's like, do you get delayed onset muscular soreness? And the answer is yes, you do get delayed onset muscular soreness. The, the damage is minimal, if any, if you don't go to failure. And so what's really interesting, and, and Dr. Lonicky, who you'll probably hear me mention a lot, um, which is the, um, he's the leading researcher, in my opinion, in the United States. He's out of the University of Mississippi, and he's published a lot of great studies. And he, he released something last year in 2019 about how long does it take for somebody to adapt to BFR, meaning... When I do BFR for my first session, I'm gonna be a lot sore. Just like if I haven't bench pressed for a while, I'll get sore after that first session. Now after the second session, I adapt, and then after the third session, I adapt even more. And so your adaptation over time is great. And so what I recommend is doing what's called an on-ramp program. And I think I'm gonna do a course next week. I actually know I'm gonna do a course next week on home exercise programming. So anytime that I introduce somebody to BFR, I'm going to do a very slow, gradual increase, meaning that, you know, the first day that I see them, I'm probably only going to do one or two exercises because they are going to get super sore. Then my next session, I might add an exercise and just see how they're tolerating. I'm a big believer in undercooking somebody before I overcook them. I don't believe in having to crush somebody because I've made the mistake of having people do exercise that's too intense. They get so sore and they're scared to see me again. They're scared to use the cuffs. And that's something that they could really take advantage of if I did a better job of on-ramping. So what I'm trying to do is um, prevent people from making the mistakes that I made, which was overstress people. And so now I kind of gradually on-ramp them over the course of about three to five sessions. Um, can you use this to help rehab a sports hernia? Um, Eric, yeah, for sure. I mean, anytime that you, the cool thing about BFR is that you don't have to change anything that you're currently doing. You're just going to use much lighter loads and apply a cuff. So if I love certain exercises, I'm going to show you the programming later on, but there's nothing that you, you really, like, I don't do plyometrics with the cuffs. I think it's too intense. It gets your heart rate and your um, blood pressure too high. I don't do, um, crazy dynamic stuff just because you can't and I can split, explain a little bit about that more if necessary but you're going to use isolated exercises for strength and hypertrophy you're going to use compound exercises for strength and hypertrophy and you're going to use um, aerobic capacity training possibly limited range of air squats uh, as well not tried them yet there yeah for sure you can definitely use any exercise that you like to use you can definitely use with BFR Darius is asking, um, I have a grade four patellofemoral tear, pulse split squats and limited flexion cycling are the options that do not cause swelling in the knee post exercise. Looking for ideas on how to get quad size back up. Yeah, so Darius, um, there are some cool things that we can do <clears throat> that doesn't include exercise. So we do passive range of motion or passive BFR using e-stim um, and no exercise at all, or you can do isometrics. That's probably what I would do with you. If you're able to do pulse split squats, I would do long hold isometrics, one minute hold, one to two minutes, depending on how you tolerate. And then, um, and for the patellar, patellar femoral, I really, really like doing them on a decline board. So I'll go on my decline board um, and I'll put people up against the wall so their feet are facing the floor and they're holding that for a minute at a time with a 30 second rest in between. All right, I'm gonna keep going and uh, Nick's gonna take care of these questions. Um, so BFR is being used in rehabilitation clinics, strength and conditioning facilities, hospitals, and a lot of uh, now is switching to at home use. So I was a VP of, uh, a VP of sports science and human performance at 24 Hour Fitness um, before about 28 of us got fired on March 23rd, um, 2013. Not that that is sitting in my head at all, but it totally changed my life and my world. I went from, you know, a place that I love to work and um, I feel, felt like I was really making, an in, making a difference in a lot of people's lives and then all of a sudden left kind of stranded 
Um, my friends that are still there, what they're saying is that home use exercise is going through the roof, like not just because of the COVID-19 thing going on, but like we're seeing it right now, um, people getting Pelotons, getting on YouTube and doing free uh, training um, because of YouTube channels. Um, it's really affecting the, uh, the gym industry and BFR is perfect to utilize home exercise with because you don't need to carry a bunch of heavy load. If you look behind me, you can see this is my rack of dumbbells. Um, oh, sorry, I'm not. I'm. I'm going to stop my share for a sec. You can see this is my rack of dumbbells. It only goes up to about twenties. I have a TRX suspension trainer, and I have um, some resistance bands, and that is really about it. I mean, I, I use very, 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 very light loads. Um, and you don't need to have a lot of weight. So it's perfect for home use. And it's also perfect for telemedicine, which is part, part of what I'm going to cover next week in my course is how do we utilize BFR with telemedicine to get people to be training and doing their rehab at home when in an environment like this, we can't, we can't um, be in contact. At least we were ordered in Dallas to be um, six feet away. Okay, so all right, where did BFR come from? It originated in Japan in about um, in the uh, late sixties. Dr. Sato at the time was practicing some martial arts. Um, he was in uh, what's called, a, uh, I think it's called a Giza position, uh, might be a Caesar position, can't recall, but he's sitting back on his haunches. I was a wrestler in college, so it was kind of like a position when you're in a starting position down on the mat, so sitting back on your haunches. And he was there, um, he was there for a long time, and he realized that he was getting blood flow cut off to his limbs, to his legs, and he started, you know, feeling some um, numbness and tingling, but he, what he noticed when he got out of the position after a long time was that his leg had swelled and it stayed swelled for, swollen for a while. And so that made him curious about, well, can I, can I recreate this? And so he started using like belts and he started using, um, making his own tourniquets and trying to exercise with the belts on and like how a lot of these things are discovered is kind of discovered out of accident. And then in the seventies, he experienced a ski accident and um, he tore a couple ligaments in his knee and he was told he had to have surgery. And it was very similar to my story where I tore a bunch of ligaments in my knee wrestling in college. And it's kind of how I got into strength and conditioning was that I just kind of rehabbed it with the help of my um, athletic trainer and strength coach um, and chiropractor and how I got into the chiropractor profession um, as well. But he basically rehabbed his knee using BFR protocols that he developed over time. And that was the, what has become the Katsu training program. And Katsu research and other things did not get, um, did not get translated to English until uh, the 2000s. So we started to see some translation in the early 2000s and then about 2012, the Department of Defense and the VA was needing a way to drive more growth hormone in people that had had traumatic injury, like when they were in um, a, a theater, like, uh, like over in Afghanistan and had injuries to soft tissue or Iraq. And if you have a soft tissue injury and you're trying to do skin grafts to cover that big area that, doesn't, that no longer has skin, you typically will take it from another part of the body and put it in that space. And then your body has to accept it. And they were getting a large rejection rate. And so what they wanted to do is use some growth hormone in order to help the people and help the soldiers and veterans accept that, uh, that skin or that graph. And growth hormone is a way that we can improve collagen formation and healing of tissue. And so what they did is they started to, they, they saw the research with blood flow restriction training spiking growth hormone. And so growth hormone is rapidly increased using BFR 
So they started to utilize it with these people that have had these graphs and they started to notice improvement. And then after that, um, they started to say, well, if we can use it with people that are having graphs done, can we start to use it with people that have had, that need prosthetics, like the heavy prosthetics when you lose a limb, the, the stump was not strong enough to support. So they started utilizing, that, utilizing it then with people that, are, um, that were amputees and they started to notice benefit in the physical therapy realm. And really, we have to give a lot of credit to um, Johnny Owens, who really discovered this within the military and DOD and then started to use the Delphi unit and start broadcasting this along the U.S. And it's really how I discovered it was through uh, my friend Skylar Richards, who used to be the director of sports medicine at, um, uh, for the, in the MLS at, at the uh, FC Dallas team up here. And um, he's like, dude, you've got to check this out because there's so much research around it that shows its validity, shows its safety, shows its uh, reliability. And when I, when I looked into the research and I looked on PubMed, there was just tons and tons and tons and tons of studies. And I went to Nick and I said, Dr. Colosi at Smart Tools, and I said, we had already, we had already, um, he had already taken instrument assisted soft tissue that used to be really, really expensive and developed some instrument assisted tools and made them FDA listed, which nobody else did, made them affordable, like a third of the price. Um, because he wanted to, he really valued instrument assisted soft tissue and he wanted to get it into the small clinic that couldn't afford really expensive tools. And I, and I recommended that, Hey, let's look at this in order to take it from, take it from something BFR being really, really expensive, like five and six and $7,000 in order to implement into something that's much more affordable. And so we just replicated what we did with instrument assisted and we did it with BFR. And so we've been around from a, from a BFR standpoint since about 2016 or so, um, where we developed generation one and then we developed generation two, which is our current model and generation three will be released um, in hopefully in July with everything that's going on, it might be delayed, but hopefully not. So to just kind of summarize, you know, it originated in Japan in the sixties. It was, it was in Japan where they were using it with um, group fitness and group exercise then it came over to the United States and interpreted or translated into, you know, into English in like the early 2000s and then has really taken root since about 2012 in the military and DOD and then has gone down into professional sports and high level universities and then um, now starting to see dissemination into um, our clinics. In 2018, BFRT was said to be part of the scope of practice for physical therapists. And you can kind of see, like I talked about, large medical systems are using it, professional sports, collegiate sports. I've been to Stanford and, I mean, a bunch of different places to teach their staff on how to utilize BFR and not just me, other companies as well. So how do we get started? I think the easiest thing um, is really first to have a goal. And, um, you know, here we are. I'm on page, I didn't number these, I should really number these pages. I'm on page six of the manual. You know, what's your goal? Do you want to increase strength? Do you want to increase size? Do you want to improve your aerobic capacity or VO2? Or all three, you can use this as a generalized fitness program. Second step is really to rule out red flags. You want to make sure that there's no contraindications, there's no increased risk of using BFR compared to normal training. If there's any question, even after this, regarding contraindications, we always recommend getting with a certified provider like myself or somebody that's certified. And in the manual, I put a link to how to find a certified provider that's been trained underneath our protocols. Um, and I also do virtual consultations as well if anybody needs help with either them or their patients. Then you choose a device. Like, are you gonna use practical, which I'm gonna talk about, or are you gonna um, use pneumatic? BFR, you have to determine what pressures you're going to use. Are you going to do practical BFR and you're going to use more of a discomfort scale, meaning 10 being very, very, very uncomfortable, like get this thing off of me. You have to be about a seven or eight out of 10, or are you going to use pneumatic where we inflate the cuffs? And in that case, you've got to be between 40 to 80% limb occlusion pressure. 
then you're going to choose exercises and your resistance. Typically resistance is going to be, um, you're going to typically do resistance training about three to five exercises in a session. I typically recommend not more than five um, exercises in a session. And if I'm going to do aerobic training, I typically do between 15 and 20 minutes. And I try to separate my aerobic from resistance. I haven't seen any studies, and if anybody has that's on here, please let me know, but I haven't seen any studies that look at, hey, if I do BFR training with aerobic and then I do resistance, do I get a blunting of muscle protein synthesis? We know outside of BFR that you do. Like if I combine aerobic first and then do resistance training, I get a blunting of muscle protein synthesis or MPS. So I, don't try, I try not to combine them. If I'm gonna do aerobic, I do it in the morning on an empty stomach just with coffee and then I'll do resistance later on in the afternoon when my hormones are elevated and I'm in a better, me personally, with my um, personalized um, neurotransmitters and how my endocrine system works, I like to train heavy in the evening, but I'm separating aerobic versus resistance. If you can't, it's better to do them all together than not at all. So I'm talking ideal to separate and then choose a frequency. With resistance, two to three times a week has been shown to be as effective as five times a week. So you don't need to train every day, but you can train up to twice a day. Knowing that there's not any damage to the tissue, you can train multiple times a day and studies have done that. And then aerobic, because it is such low intensity, you're gonna get better results doing it more than less. So three to five times a week, I think is gonna be your minimum in order to get, depends on how fit you are, but your minimum is going to be to adapt three to five times a week. I got a question from Roger Tarago. I think that's hopefully right. Um, any significant differences between continuous versus intermittent? So continuous BFR is when um, I'm using BFR in a manner that I'm putting the cuffs on um, and I'm training. Intermittent is when I'm putting the cuffs on after my training or between sets or between, yeah, between sets. So I do a bunch of sets and then I put the cuffs on. And the answer is there doesn't appear to be much difference between continuous and intermittent. Um, from a reality standpoint though, it's very cumbersome to be putting them on after I do my normal training. So I recommend using the cuffs while you're doing the training and not doing it um, and not doing the, the BFR afterwards um, or after your sets in most of circumstances, not all, but most. Um, okay, risks and contraindications. So what are we concerned about? Um, we're con concerned about thrombosis or formation of platelets. Uh, we're, co we're concerned about which could cause a stroke or um, get it into the lung. Uh, we're concerned about cardiovascular stress, both heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and injury from tourniquets. So let me talk about these a little bit. Thrombosis is caused by occlusion of blood flow, um, hypercoagulability, and damage to blood vessels. So we wanna make sure that this is not occurring. And what the research has really shown is that there doesn't appear to be any increased thrombus risk when you use BFR. Now, if people are predisposed, like I have a patient that I, that I treat, she has a 360 degree cage um, around her spine from basically T2 to sacrum. Um, she's got a lot of other things going on and she gets a lot of deep vein thrombosis and I do not use BFR with her. I would love to, um, but I don't think that it's reasonable. And so if they're predisposed to hypercoagulability, then I will not use BFR with them. And there has been studies looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of sessions of BFR. Like I think one study was over 12,000 sessions. And this was based out of Japan and their incidence rate of injury was very, 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 very low, like less than 0.001%. So I'm not concerned in normal circumstances about thrombus risk. Where I take a little bit more caution is number one, post-surgically. 
if you're not a certified provider, I just, let's say I just got ACL surgery and I'm not a certified provider, I'm not a medical professional, I would wait probably three to four weeks before integrating BFR into my um, rehab program. Um, because anytime that we have an orthopedic surgery of the extremities, especially, our increase in risk of DVT goes way up. And so um, just to play on the conservative side, I would wait. Um, and that's why under here on page six out of 11, I have these contraindications. I have, if you have a history of DVT, um, if you're pregnant, um, varicose veins are not a absolute contraindication, but it is a risk factor for decreased blood flow to the limb. So you just wanna be cognizant of that. High blood pressure, especially that's uncontrolled. Um, cardiac disease, lymphedema, caution should be taken with people under the age of 15. And again, I put, you know, non-medical professionals should wait four weeks after surgery. The other time that you need to wait is if a scar is bigger than two inches. So if I have a scar that's bigger than two inches, when we use BFR, we drive down something called myostatin. And we want to drive down myostatin in order to, to accelerate hypertrophy and muscle protein synthesis. But because of TPA antigen, it also reduces the amount of scar tissue formation that we can create. And so if you have a big scar, you're going to reduce the ability to create scar in a acute manner. So weight, if something, if somebody's got a scar that's bigger than two weeks, you've got to wait two weeks to do BFR anywhere in order for that scar to, um, heal and then you can start. Uh, Matt Lee asked me, do you typically take vitals prior to it utilizing BFR or is this typically screened through the patient history examination? Uh, my answer to that would be I typically do my initial patient history. I look at their medical history to see if they're having any contraindications. I ask them specifically and I have a separate, um, a separate consent for BFR. If they are, um, if they're borderline with their hypertension, um, then I will do a, a, I will do blood pressure, I will do heart rate, and then I will do it after their first um, exercise. And then I will see how their heart rate and their BP is responding. If you go on my Instagram, um, I think I have a, a, a graphic on there about, uh, you know what, I haven't posted that yet, I just had it made where what happens with blood pressure and BFR and heart rate and BFR, and it does go up over other exercise, but not in dangerous ranges. But with anybody that has a precondition, I'm going to screen them. Okay, so yeah, so from a thrombus standpoint, it looks like we create TPA antigen using BFR and high intensity training, by the way, that's what this study was showing by Clark, um, which TPA antigen is an anti-thrombus um, antigen. So it might even be preventative to thrombus, but we have to, um, we have to uh, continue to be cautious. Um, all right. Tourniquet injury can be caused by prolonged duration. So I recommend less than 20 minutes. Well, 20 minutes or less. Using excessively narrow cuffs, less than five centimeters is considered narrow and high pressures. So we wanna to try to utilize a cuff that hits the sweet, sweet spot. It's not narrow, which allows us to use lower pressures to get the occlusion that is um, necessary to get the benefits that we're looking for. And direct skin contact for people that have thin skin. So if they have really like really sensitive skin, I'm gonna use something um, underneath that underneath that cuff in order to prevent, and I'll show what that kind of looks like. All right, so. This is a dual ply tensor, okay? So um, this is something that I could put on on somebody's limb, these are washable. It also keeps the cuffs much more hygienic. So um, on my YouTube channel, you can see a way to clean cuffs. Um, but 
if this is what I'm using underneath the cuff, then I'm going to keep these cuffs much more hygienic in a, in a time right now where, um, you know, hygiene is everything. I think it's smart to use something. And I just get these, you know, off of, um, I just get these off uh, this, this roll off of Amazon or Kramer, Medco, any of those. But it's the same type of tensor that we would use in, um, like in the athletic training room for an ankle sprain or sort of causing some sort of compression. Dual ply has been shown to be more effective than single ply, like a cast, cast tensor, not as effective. So this is what I would use. In the lower extremity, I use something a little wider and I put it all the way up here and then I can put the cuff on around my upper thigh. All right, let's go back to share. Okay, um, so if you see here, wider cuffs equate to decreased pressures. This is from Crenshaw. So if I use a wider cuff, I don't need as much pressure in order to occlude arterial flow. And I don't get a lot into the actual mechanisms here because it was only a 90 minute, um, but you can, I think on my YouTube channel, I have a bunch of stuff about mechanisms and other things, but one of the biggest mechanisms is creating a, a hypoxic environment and uh, a decrease in blood flow. So if we decrease blood flow, the way that we do that is by um, occluding the artery. And so if we can occlude that artery, then we decrease the blood flow, then you run out of, basically you create lactate, you run out of sugar through the exercise, the lactate can't get to the liver in order to create more sugar to get back to the muscle. And so we have to switch from aerobic to anaerobic um, metabolism. And that's one of the main reasons that we get benefits the way that we do. Um, but wider cuffs allow us to use less pressure, thus reducing risk to, from the tourniquet. So here's some risk categories. Patients with poor circulation, again, this doesn't mean that they're contraindicated. It just means I've got to have a yellow flag up to make sure that, hey, everything else is in line. If they have varicosities, if they have poor capillary refill time, abnormal clotting times, atherosclerotic vessels, arterial calcification, diabetes, cardiopulmonary conditions, hypertension, infection, sickle cell trait, medications. HRT stands for hormone replacement therapy. Um, one of the things that I look out for is a lot of patients come in that have pellets now. It's, well, I'm in Dallas, and so a lot of people have pellets put into the skin and so that they're getting hormones as a slow release. I want to see what their hematocrit levels are because sometimes those hematocrit levels go up with hormone replacement. could be the same with somebody that's on a blood um, birth control. I want to see what their their blood panel looks like because sometimes those hematocrits get up into the high 50s, early, low 60s. And when that hematocrit is so, when that blood is so thick, they're going to be a much more risk for um, having a stroke or an embolism. So um, just check it. And if you're not sure, check with their physician. It's a great opportunity to have a conversation about BFR, about exercise, about how you go about uh, with your patients. So what are some contraindications? And I'll run through these. Um, acidosis, cancer, extremities with a dialysis port, excessive swelling. In the literature, I've never seen anything that's been um, defined excessive. The way that I classify excessive is that if I have somebody post-surgically, let's say, or they have an acute knee injury and their limb is two inches circumferentially larger on one side compared to the non-involved side, that's too much swelling. I'm gonna spend my time getting rid of the swelling. I'm gonna do manual therapy, I'm gonna do norm attack, I'm gonna do other things in order to push the swelling out of there. Less than two inches circumferential one side versus the other, then I consider that not excessive and I will use BFR. Increased intracranial pressure, impaired circulation, lymphedema on that limb, open fracture, open wound. Pregnancy is a contraindication for sure. Um, previous revascular, and let me go back to that. <clears throat> I believe that because you'll see people with that are pregnant on Instagram and other things using BFR and that's up to them. But me as a healthcare provider, I've got to look out for the best interests of my patient. 
if that patient has an early pregnancy or is spontaneously aborted and they can link anything to something abnormal being like, hey, this guy did be a far to them, even if it wasn't my fault, I would feel, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I've had um, a really, really good friend, um, him and his wife, they were pregnant, they were getting late into pregnancy and they had a spontaneous abortion and it, it literally, losing that child literally was devastating to them, devastating. And I do not wanna be associated with that. Same thing for dry needling. I don't dry needle pregnant women. I know a lot of acupuncturists that do. That's what they do, and they take on that risk. Awesome. I do not want to be associated with any adverse events. And so for me, waiting a little bit longer in order to incorporate this is okay. I'll think of other ways in conjunction with their OBGYN to create an exercise program uh, without putting them at more risk. That's just me, but um, I recommend it. Severe hypertension, severe crush injury, vascular grafts, venous thromboembolisms, um, so you can kind of read the rest of this. I know there's a big list here. For the most part, BFR is very, very, very safe. If there's anything in here that you're not sure about, check with your physician, check with a certified provider, um, and make sure that you're proceeding safely before doing anything else. All right, let me see any other... Oh, Daryl Richmond, anytime, my friend. Um, that'd be great to get together. Um, Michael Shapiro, what happens when using BFR for clients with lymphedema? Um, you know, I, I think I just mentioned that excessive swelling. Now, have I used this with people that have lymphedema, but it's controlled? Absolutely. I'm very careful with my pressures. I use much less pressure than typical. I see how they respond, but I have an honest conversation with them. My last person I did this with lymphedema, she was begging me to do something. She's like, nobody does anything for me. My muscles are atrophying. Please do something. And I, you know, I tell her like, hey, this is the risk. She signs a consent. She understands the risk. Um, and we undercook. We had a great response, good muscle um, increases. She uses it at home under my guidance now. But you want to have that conversation with patients. And a lot of times I get people that have no other options. And so I want to create an option as long as it's safe and sometimes I'll co-manage those. Is there an absolute contraindication for blood pressure? Like if they have a systolic over 140, uh, 169 is the absolute contraindication. Um, diastolic over 99 is an absolute contraindication. Um, so that's not an absolute, Joshua, that's just a, a relative. Uh, let's see, Chandler, I have class at one, not be able to stay for the entire session, but I would love to hear his thoughts on this. On um, guessing uh, arterial insufficiency and venous insufficiency patients would be contraindicated as a whole. Um, you know, I kind of talked about this a little bit. Do they have an increased risk of thrombus? I don't think so. I really don't. Um, you know, arterial insufficiencies are contraindicated. Um, I would take all caution. I would, I would do, if I was going to implement this with a patient, I would do it on a table. I would check vitals pre, post. I would keep pressures super low. Um, I would make sure I'm taking those cuffs off between sessions. Um, I would make sure that they have a very high informed risk um, or a high informed consent done. And, um, and you go into it together with con in conjunction with their uh, physician. Okay, um, pros and cons to all devices. I'm still sharing, right? Yeah, still sharing. Okay, so there's pros and cons to all. Um, there's cost associated, there's cuff widths, there's detachable hoses, non-detachable hoses. There's reliability of holding pressures. There's FDA listing, there's length of the cuffs, there's flexibility of the cuffs, meaning are they rigid or do they um, give a little bit? Lots of different, um, so I'm going to talk about, there's really two different ways to restrict blood flow. There is something called pneumatic, which is what ours, ours is, um, occlusion cuff is, uh, Delphi is, um, be strong. These all get inflated. So if I, if I put the cuff on,
I'm going to attach a pump and I'm going to inflate this cuff to a desired millimeter of mercury pressure. So that's going to be caught. That's going to be considered a pneumatic. Okay. Practical is something where people will use something like a voodoo floss and they'll put that on and then they'll wrap it around or they'll use something like a rock cuff or they'll use something um, where you're not, you don't really know what the pressures are. You're, you're kind of trying to best guesstimate. Okay. So there's practical and there's pneumatic. Okay. And so practical, like I was mentioning, elastic bands, straps, knee wraps, voodoo bands, these are typically going to be very thin, um, hard to control pressure. Um, if you're in the middle of a session and the pain levels get above a seven or eight out of 10, you're going to have to reduce, you're going to take the whole thing off. There's no way to adjust the pressure on the fly. Um, in addition, Dr. Lonicky um, suggests with one of his studies that he didn't see as much benefit with something that's really elastic or that gives a lot because he doesn't think that the metabolites that you're creating distal to the cuff are getting trapped. And so um, we don't see um, as much of a benefit. Now, there has been some studies showing that it can be beneficial. Um, we just don't think it's as beneficial as using something a bit more rigid. Our cuffs, um, Delphi cuff, uh, occlusion cuff, um, all a little bit different. These are inflatable. They have a bladder system inside. You use a sphygmometer or a pump and they're a little bit more rigid. So um, if I stop this share and I, and I show this, so, so a couple things. All the cuffs are gonna have a certain width. Here's the width that I'm talking about, is the actual width. And so if I'm to measure this, we want this to be, in, again, in my opinion, greater than five centimeters. Anything less, according to the research, is considered narrow, which is gonna require much more pressure and is also gonna be much more uncomfortable compared to a wider cuff. Now, why didn't we make this cuff this wide? And the reason is that if you get too wide, there's also a problem. And so we have to choose a balance between too wide and too narrow. And so we chose something about this. Our next generation is gonna be just slightly smaller because we wanted something that didn't, uh, didn't um, interfere as much with the, um, like the movement of the limb, um, but still going to be wide, still gonna require less pressure which means possibly less uh, risk to damage uh, due to the tourniquet. Uh, let's see. Um, FDA approval, this is a common misconception. FDA approval is not necessary, but FDA listing is um, for a uh, class uh, I'm having a brain fart. Class three, I believe, medical device. Nick, change, update me if that's not correct. But What's the question, Ed? Sorry, I was answering emails and... <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, uh, class three de medical device or class one? I can't remember. Uh, this is a class one pneumatic tourniquet, yeah. Class one pneumatic tourniquet. So that's what, it, it's, a, it's called an FDA listing. It, 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 just one quick, uh, one quick thing, Ed. Um, if you guys are, have any questions, please don't email. Please, um, please do it on the Q and A on here or the chat. Don't email me because I can't do three things at one time. Thanks. Okay, so um, thanks. So, class one medical device, FDA listed um, as a as a medical device, um, and and the reason that we recommend this is that that way there's somebody overseeing the quality, um, there's somebody overseeing the safety. And um, it's not just me manufacturing something and throwing it out into the marketplace because it's hot. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money to make sure that we're not only doing something that's valid, but that's reliable and that's safe. All right, so where do we place these cuffs? Um, on the upper extremity, as I showed you, so it's right below the deltoid tubercle. And in the lower extremity, it's right below the uh, greater trochanter. Okay, and if we go over to okay, so right below the greater trochanter, and then how much pressure do we use? Um, 
we use something, and what we recommend is something based on limb occlusion pressure. So the definition of limb occlusion pressure is the minimum pressure needed to sufficiently occlude deep arteries and the superficial veins. So I'm gonna stop my share for a second. Okay, so I've got a couple things here. I've got my pump, and I've got something called a Doppler. And sorry about that. It's like the first uh, call in a, it feels like in a while from in the clinic. All right, so I'm gonna put the cuff on. And when I put the cuff on, I like to put the valve so it's facing forward. It makes life a little easier. So I put the cuff on. Now I can feel, because right now what's happening is 100% of artery flow is going into my limb and 100% of venous return is coming back to my heart. So I'm not occluding anything right now because I haven't inflated this. If I take my pulse, and what I'm going to do is use the Doppler so hopefully people can hear it. And I'm going to put this, so I've got my Doppler on. So you can hear that pulse. So now I'm going to connect. This is going to be really hard to do. I'll try to do 40 things at once here. So I'm going to connect in and much interference, but I would inflate this up until I no longer have a pulse. And then I would look down and see what the pressure is on my gauge. And that is your limb occlusion pressure. Now, some people teach go past it and then let it slowly bounce back until you hear it again, meaning go past where you no longer hear and then go back and then let it then slowly release some air from the cuff until you hear it again. So your limb occlusion pressure would be a couple of millimeters of mercury above that because if you're hearing the pulse again, that means that there is blood flow going through. So it's gotta be a little bit more than that to fully occlude. I tend to, I've been doing this now for so long, I just inflate and as I'm getting close because I know where it's gonna be based on just me visualizing it and seeing it, doing with this with enough patients, plus teaching this in classes all the time, I know about how much it's going to be so I inflate it to right about the point where I think it's going to be. If I overshoot it, then I'll slowly release and then I'll kind of see where it's at. If you're one or two millimeters of mercury off, it's not that big of a deal because we're still going to only take a percentage of that limb occlusion pressure to um, determine what to train at. So that's limb occlusion pressure. Again, it's the minimum pressure needed to sufficiently occlude deep arteries and the superficial veins. Basically the pressure required to eliminate the pulse. So here's that Doppler. In the upper extremity, we use the radial artery. In the um, lower extremity, we use the dorsalis pedis, that's what DP is, or uh, tibialis posterior, posterior, um, posterior tibialis, however you say it. Okay, so here's me demonstrating how to do on that um, dorsalis pedis. And this would be getting it for the seated position. So your limb occlusion pressures will change based on if you're standing, if you're seated, or if you're supine. So depending on what position you're gonna exercise in is the position that I would get your limb occlusion pressure. At minimum, I would do standing and lying. And then if you're doing a seated exercise, like a long arc quad, you would use the standing because those are going to be fairly close. But to be in the clinic, for sure, I would use and document 
I utilized um, the best evidence because this is what the research is really recommending, what we call a personalized limb occlusion pressure, meaning that I'm not just taking an arbitrary number and using that as a pressure. So I recommend doing it in the same position as exercising, either supine, seated, or standing. And if you don't have a Doppler, which I totally get, like you, people don't want to invest in a, and it's a hundred bucks or so, you don't want to get a Doppler. You want to know how to implement this without a Doppler. The pressure should never exceed eight out of 10. And I gave you some rough, some kind of rough estimates on the pressure. So here it's like, if the limb is up to 16 inches, you're gonna use somewhere between 120 and 160. If the limb is between 16 and 22 inches, you're gonna use somewhere between 150 and 180. And if the limb is 22 or bigger, it's gonna be somewhere between 180 and 300. So what I would do is if I don't have a Doppler, I'm not getting a personalized LOP, I would start with the lower number, do a training session, if you're not feel like you feel like it's too light, then you can increase the pressure and I would increase by like 10 millimeters of mercury each session until I get to the point where you're like, okay, this seems like the right pressure where you're not causing above an eight out of 10 pressure, um, but you are getting enough pressure that you're right around that seven out of 10. Cause they've looked at whether it's enough pressure to be like at a four or a three or a two out of 10. And the answer is no. So, that's why I personally like to quantify it because otherwise it's a, it's a big guessing game. Now with our new cuffs coming out, we are gonna have a pump that will basically plug in. You're gonna set your limb occlusion pressure and hit a button and it's gonna inflate to that pressure. So it's gonna make life a lot easier. And I wish that we had them right now, but with manufacturing and everything going on, um, but it's gonna be really nice to be able to just plug in, set your pressure, and it's going to automatically do all this for you. So what are some pros and cons? So no Doppler pro, um, it's fast, it's inexpensive. What are the cons of no, pro, no Doppler? You can't really quantify the pressure and you can't really adjust the pressure um, based on experience because it's really hard to know what pressure you're using. If, um, what was the other thing I was gonna say? I also, if I'm, if I'm somewhere I can't hear the Doppler, I will use a pulse. Now, not on the first session. On the first session, I always am gonna put in, I used the standard of care right now is use a Doppler, personalized limb occlusion pressure in every position. If I'm in the athletic training room and it's really loud and I can't get a Doppler reading or I forget my Doppler, I will use a pulse on other um, sessions. So you take a pulse, you inflate the cuff until that pulse disappears you're gonna be pretty close because we're still, again, gonna just take a percentage of that pressure. Okay, so what are some limb occlusion pressure variables? Because you're like, well, is it always the same? And the answer is no, because limb circumference, how much fat is in the limb or morphology compared to how much lean mass, people's systolic blood pressure will have an effect, race has an effect, um, gender has an effect, body position has an effect, hydration levels could have an effect. Okay. How do cuff widths affect LOP? Um, pros of a wider cuff, it decreases pressures, improved hypoxia, um, it, uh, improves comfort, cons, it interferes with joint movement. Um, and if it's too wide, it might actually blunt muscle protein synthesis underneath that um, cuff. So you don't want it too wide. There's gotta be a happy medium in there about width versus um, uh, with or lack of width versus width. So a couple studies just to kind of demonstrate this. Rosso demonstrated wider cuffs are required to induce hypoxia. Um, wider cuffs appear to be more comfortable. Um, and then here's your practical. If you just don't have cuffs, but you can still inflate them, you're going to use the pressures here. Now, what if I'm using Voodoo Floss or something that doesn't have anything, any built-in gauge? In those cases, what you're gonna use is, um, you're gonna have to use the, you know, that seven to eight out of 10 discomfort scale to know what pressure to use. Okay, so here's just a summary page. Okay, so practical seven to eight out of 10 discomfort, pneumatic, um, upper extremity, you're gonna use typically between 40 and 50% of your LOP. 
lower extremity, you're going to use something between 60 and 80% LOP. So let's say I determine that I have a 200 LOP in my lower extremity and I start off doing a walking program. I would use 120 of my, I would use 120 as a, the millimeter of mercury pressure as a starting point because that's 60% LOP. So hopefully that it makes sense. Okay, so now let's get into a little bit of programming. So strength and hypertrophy. So if we wanna create strength or size, the programming is the exact same. I'm gonna use something between 20 and 40% of one's one rep max. Do you always know your one rep max? No, especially people that are injured. When they come in and I'm doing rehab, I have no idea what their one rep max is, especially for that injured tissue. So I've got to guess. And what I guess with, again, undercook before you overcook, if you typically would use a red uh, resistance tubing with somebody during that stage of exercise or it's that stage of rehab, start with that. You're gonna use the same exercises and programming as you were doing prior if you're doing in the rehab setting. If you're not doing the rehab setting, what I would do is I would, and I'll spend more time on this next week, I would, I would set one day of getting all set up, meaning I would get my max, um, I would get all my one rep maxes done that I'm gonna exercise it with, with the first, like let's say 30 day training session. I would, um, I would know what exercises that I can do 75 reps with, with no BFR to make sure I can do it with BFR. Um, I would get my limb occlusion pressures. You don't have to do limb occlusion pressures. That's what I failed to mention. You don't have to do limb occlusion pressures every single session. You can do them on the first session and then do them again after four weeks. Why do we have to do them again? Because your body's going to adapt. You're probably going to have some hypertrophy occur. You're probably going to have some adaptation and you're probably going to have um, some vascularization um, to the tissue. So you're going to have some changes. So you want to do it about every four weeks or so. So um, when we're doing strength training, size training, 20 to 40% one rep max, each exercise is composed of four sets. 30 repetitions, take a 30 second rest. 15 repetitions, 30 second rest. 15 repetitions, 30 second rest. 15 repetitions, 30 second rest. So that's what that means by with a 30 second interset rest. You're gonna keep the cuffs inflated during the whole exercise. So let me show what this kind of looks like. So if I'm doing a modified push-up, I'm gonna inflate the cuffs to my desired pressure. In this, in this situation, I would start off with 40% of my limb occlusion pressure. I would perform 30 repetitions. I would then rest for 30 seconds, then perform 15 repetitions, rest for 30 seconds, perform 15 repetitions, rest for 30 seconds, perform 15 repetitions, and then deflate the cuff, move on to the next exercise, and I try to do that within one minute. So by the time you deflate the cuff and you move on to the next exercise, you're about ready to inflate again. So if you notice, this is 30, 15, 15, 15, which is 75 total reps, pretty high amount of reps, but it's light load, so you know it has to be this way. If we're doing something in the lower extremity, this is what along our quad might look like. So I'm using the cuffs. Um, I'm doing primarily quad work here. Again, 30, 15, 15, 15, 30 second interset rest. In this situation, if I needed to add some ankle weights, I could to make it the load more. How do I know if I, know to, I need to increase load? The first 30 repetitions should be super easy. I should be able to get through those and you look at me um, or I look at you and I'm like, that was easy, dude. What is this BFR thing? My second set, when I start to get to about 10 repetitions, I should be like, okay, I'm starting to get a little tired. My third set, I should be like, uh, oh boy. Um, yeah, this uh, is not comfortable, but I'm able to finish. And then by the fourth set, I'm almost at volitional failure at that last 15, like I could maybe do a couple more reps, but um, I finish, so I'm done. So I'm within about three reps of volitional failure. That would be ideal. How I know is that somebody finishes that last set of 15 and they look at me like, please get these cuffs off of me. Then I know I've got the right pressure and the right uh, load, okay? 
And here's an example of a compound exercise, like a lunge. You can do walking lunges, they're real tough. I like split squats as well. Um, if you have the time to do a one rep max, which I would recommend if you're a strength and conditioning coach or you're working with clients and they're healthy, I would get a one rep max estimate. And the way that you can do this is based on like either a three rep max or a five rep max. Okay, so let's say somebody does five repetitions. Now I make them do them perfectly. Like, like if they're doing a squat, they've got, they got weight on their back and I get them, like I do a warm up set, I do a second warm up set and I'm gradually building them up to a five rep max. If they do five, but they can't do six, I'll say, okay, that's your five rep max done perfectly. Whatever that weight is, I multiply that times 115. Okay, so I multiply that times one, one I'm sorry, 1.15. And that will give me your estimated one rep max. So the example I give here, in this case, I'm using a 10 rep max. So let's say the 10 rep max, they could do 10 reps perfectly, but if they try to do 11 reps, they couldn't do it. Let's say that's 100 pounds. So they would take that weight that they could do 10 times, which was 100 pounds, multiply that times 1.33. So 133 pounds is your estimated one rep max. So now I say, okay, well, how much weight do I want to work with then doing BFR? I'm going to start off at 20% of your one rep max. So I'm going to take 0 0.20 times your estimated one rep max, which is 27 pounds. So that's what I would start with from a training standpoint. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's see if there's any questions on that. Um, okay, no questions it looks like, or Nick will get to them. All right, when we're doing aerobic capacity training, Ed, can you hear me actually? Uh, yeah, I got you. Okay, on, on Q and A, we had a quite a few. Did you? I don't know if you answered them or not, but um, one, one, somebody asked about a sweatshirt underneath the the cuffs. Is that too thick? Yeah, Vin, that's too thick. Um, you'll get too much sliding underneath the, especially these pressure cuffs. You'll get too much sliding. And so then, I would use um, like a tight Under Armour shirt, or I would use something like this dual sleeve. And uh, Vin, I'm honored that you would be on this call, by the way. And then Damon, um, if you scroll up a little bit more um, from one of the earlier questions regarding uh, arterial insufficiency in CHF, I'm not sure if you answered it or not. I think I answered it, but if I didn't, then um, send me an email. But I, I, I went through that pretty, pretty well, I think. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, for aerobic capacity training, here's where I think we can see so much improvement in people quickly. Um, and the research is really, really amazing. Like they've taken uh, basketball players, division one basketball players. Now division one basketball players, in my opinion, I was a wrestler in college. I think I'm a reasonable athlete. Division one basketball players are probably the best athletes on campus. I know people can argue with me, but they're amazing athletes. They took, they took division one basketball players. They walked three times a week for 15 minutes. After six weeks, I believe, they showed an 11% increase in VO2. That is hard to do with that little of time. So I recommend personally, just from a health standpoint, every morning you move your body just a little bit. You get outside, you get some sun, um, you expose your body as much as you can and you go for a brisk walk. That would be a perfect time to do BFR because you put the, you're now making that brisk walk a physiologically adapting um, modality. Whereas if I do that brisk walk, for most people, you're not gonna see any adaptation with walking. You'd have to walk a long way, very, very fast. So um, you can see here, you can do this one or two times per day if you wanted to. If you really wanted to get your aerobic capacity up, like you've been, um, you know, you've been bedridden you just got cleared and now you want to get you you're really feeling like you're gassing you're getting out of air this is the modality that i would use and i would use it regularly the other cool thing about walk training is that not only do you get cardiovascular benefit but evidence suggests that you get strength at the knee and size at the thigh so you're changing cross-sectional area of the thigh 
And in my mind, if I can improve lean mass in your thigh and make your knees stronger and make your hips stronger, you're gonna be able to prevent fall. And that's one of the things that we need to do in this country. We need to get people walking with cuffs when it's safe, of course, on a regular basis to now make their exercise that they're choosing to be um, something to adapt to. Anyway, get off my soapbox. How do we know how to do a challenging walk? We're gonna do something called calculating your heart rate reserve. So heart rate reserve is an estimate of your VO2. Now, in the clinic, I can get VO2. I've got some special equipment and I can do that and I can really set your parameters. Most people are not gonna go get a VO2 max test done. Most people are not gonna go, most of the time you have to go to the university to do it. I'm just a nerd. Um, and so you can use the heart rate reserve as an estimate of VO2. This is how you do it. First thing that I want you to do, and if you have this sheet already made, I want you to calculate what your resting heart rate is. So I'm gonna go back to me right now. One of the easiest ways with most of my um, patients to find their resting heart rate is to simply go on their watch. And they just need to go on there, especially if they're wearing an Apple watch or some sort of, um, or if they're wearing a, an aura ring if they're, if they're wearing a whoop band, if they're wearing any of these things, what they can do is just go and look and see what is their lowest heart rate for the day. That is going to be their resting heart rate. If they don't have a resting heart rate that's calculated, you're gonna to have to estimate it by doing like a, um, just a, a, a radial pulse or a carotid artery pulse. And I would recommend doing it before they get out of bed in the morning, before they're up and about drinking coffee, you know, doing their brisk walk and all that stuff. So in your manual, we have find your resting heart rate and calculate that and put that there. I'm going to get a drink of water and I'm going to give everybody a minute to calculate their resting heart rate or find it um, on their phone. So if I want to be a timer, I'll do that. What I want you to do I'm gonna set the timer. So one minute in three, two, one, start with zero and go. Okay, so that's your resting heart rate. And what I would do is plug your resting heart rate into this. So resting heart rate goes right here. Now you're gonna find your max heart rate. So your max heart rate, we're just gonna use 220. This is Carvonen's method, 220 minus your age. So me, I would be 220 minus 46 is equal to my estimated max heart rate. So calculate that and put it in here. Now your max heart rate is going to be higher than your resting heart rate. So your max heart rate subtract your resting heart rate is your heart rate reserve. So this minus this should go right here. Multiply that times the intensity that you want to train at. So we start people at 30% of their heart rate reserve or 40% of their VO2 max. So you're gonna take 0.3, 
and multiply it towards times your HRR. So take 0.3, multiply times your HRR, then add back in your resting heart rate and that's going to give you your training target. So that's what we should be training at. For most of us here, it's going to be somewhere between 95 and 120 or so probably. If you're a little bit older, it might go down to 90. But what I want you to take home from this is that it's not very high. Like 95 for me is, is easy to get to. And so what that means is that when I put the cuffs on and I go for a walk and I get my heart rate up to like 95 or 100 or 105, that now is going to be a physiologically adapting exercise, whereas before it wasn't. So let me give you another example of when to use this. There's a lot of clinics that have people um, start off using an aerobic machine before they do their session to get warmed up versus using like a hydrocolator pack or a heat pack or something. I would use BFR to make that a physiologically adapting exercise. So meaning they come into the clinic, they're going to jump on the treadmill or the bike or the stepper or the rower. I would put the cuffs on and be like, okay, let's make this an adapting exercise versus just being kind of um, a passive warm up because it's still low enough, it's not gonna be any problem, okay? Just keep in mind that if I'm really trying to create hypertrophy, um, you're gonna get a little bit of a blunting effect, I think, just based on normal training. So I try to separate those for home use, but in the clinic, that's really hard to do. Okay, let me see if I can look at any questions right now that I can answer really quick, and then I'm getting kind of up to my time right now. Uh, Greg, you know, that's a really good question when they have large thighs and it kind of rubs. It does rub. Um, sometimes people with large thighs, they have to be in a, on a bike if it's too uncomfortable for them to utilize. So if you have somebody that's, you know, really, really big, I, you know, I get it. it, can, it that can be a bit of an issue. Would using BFR on a rebounder interfere with the lymph flow? I don't think so. Um, I use BFR with a vibration plate a lot for the same reasons, for lymphatic, for bone density, for other, uh, for other things. And it works great. And uh, there's been a study with BFR and um, vibration plate and it increases stem cell production dramatically. So I would keep doing that. If you use BFR with isometrics, how long would you do those hold? Mark, that's a really, really great question. And the answer is you hold for one minute, you take a 30 second rest, you hold for one minute, you do a 30 second rest, and I try to get a third round out of that uh, hold. The key is getting people tired. I am convinced that the way that our bodies adapt, the way that our brains start to say, hey, I gotta do some sort of recovery here is through that fatigue factor. And so if it knows it's getting fatigued, all of a sudden now I gotta lay down that cascade of recovery. See, it thinks that you just did some heavy intense exercise. So just get them tired. So what I typically put in my programming is one to two minutes of an isometric hold, 30 to 60 second rest, depending how much they need, but not more than 60 seconds. It gets to be long. Uh, Chad Oliver, it says to deflate and move to the next exercise after. How long should we keep the cuff deflated between exercises in the same body region? I recommend a minute or less. Mohammed, what, um, what did you want me to explain again? Give me that. Sorry if I wasn't clear. Let me go up to Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, when doing a long arc quad, when the patient sits on the cuff, would you pump the cuff prior to the appropriate, um, or do you pump it up in the appropriate millimeters of mercury? Well, I think that's a really great question, Reggie. I don't think it matters, to be honest. You might elevate that pressure a little bit, a couple millimeters of mercury, but it's not gonna be much. But I think it would be totally reasonable to inflate the cuff while they're seated, because then you're gonna get the compression. And I think what Reggie's alluding to is that if I'm sitting on the cuff, it's going to compress and it might increase the pressure if I, do the, if I do the pressure in standing. I think by doing the pressure in standing, the pressure in standing is the highest. If I use the pressure in standing and then go to sitting, it's probably gonna be pretty close. But again, we're, we're, going, we're taking it down to 80%. So we might be one or two millimeters of mercury elevated. Not that big of a deal because if they get to an eight out of 10, that's too uncomfortable, they can't continue to exercise. What's cool is our cuffs, 
our cuffs have this little built-in valve. All I need to do is hit this cuff, this little valve once, and that deflates by about 10 millimeters of mercury. So let's say I'm doing a bicep curl, and I'm like, I don't think I can do anymore. I have two choices. I can drop the weight, or I can deflate the cuff. I recommend dropping the weight because your body's adaptation to the cuff is really important to me. So I'd rather drop the weight, but let's say I don't have any weights in my hand and I'm still like, oh my God, I can't finish. What I would do is I would press it and then I would um, let them finish those reps. So hopefully that answers, but I wouldn't, I would say you're totally right on with doing the inflation in a seated position. Um, if you're doing isometric holds, uh, I, Abby, I think I answered that. That's a one minute, 30 second rest, one to two minutes basically. What is a common response from a patient that the pressure is not high enough? The common response is uh, these exercises are too easy. And the way that I, so it, it's really gonna base it based on your cuff. Like I'll see on Instagram, people putting cuffs on their upper extremities and their lower extremities at the same time. You can't do that with these cuffs. And the reason is this, and I think I failed to mention this, our cuffs are made with a continuous bladder. That continuous bladder is occluding arterial flow. If, if that bladder is segmented, and there are other companies that use a segmented bladder, metabolites can escape and the exercise is way too easy. When people use our cuffs and the Delphi system, they, they tell you how difficult it is compared to using some of these other cuffs because it's just, it's just a, it's a total different experience um, based on the diaphragm. So if it's too easy, they can easily finish the exercise. It's not 20% of their one rep max is not enough. You got to use way more pressure. And I think that's what happens a lot of times when people are like, oh, I'm using 70% one rep max. Um, a University of Michigan study just came out last year looking at using higher, higher loads. You don't need to use higher loads. There's no reason to use higher loads with BFR. There's no increased benefit that's been shown over and over and over again. We're using 20 to 35%. If they can lift heavy loads, a majority of their training should be done with heavy loads. We're not replacing high intensity training. We're using BFR as an adjunct. We're using BFR as a replacement until we can get back up to high intensity load, or we're using it because they can't do high intensity load due to disability, age, uh, injury, something else. Have I seen used BFR utilizing concussion patients? I have, and um, you know, not specifically for the concussion, but for other reasons. I don't know if there's a benefit or if there's not a benefit. Um, from the uh, from a neurocognitive standpoint, I'm not sure, but no contraindication. I guess um, decreased blood flow would be something that would come into mind, especially in an acute concussion. But if it's that acute um, and they exercise and their symptoms elevate, we decrease exercise anyway, right? When we're starting to challenge people on their return to play, I would treat it just like a normal exercise bout with concussion. How early after ACL? I've seen it done the same day. Well, that's not true. Same day as return to the clinic, so the next day from surgery. Just make sure that those are portals and not large, um, large uh, incisions. Make sure there's no pre-existing condition um, and there's nothing in the health history that would tell you that they're predisposed to thrombus because they are at an increase in thrombus. I had an um, athlete from Stanford come see me. Um, he hurt his, um, he's a starting left tackle he, um, he uh, fractured his ankle and he doesn't mind me telling stories about, about him. Um, he fractured his ankle and had a DVT after the ankle fracture surgery. Um, but he came to see me about six or eight weeks later. He was off of his blood thinners, no other signs, no other preexisting um, predisposition for DVT and we used it fine. And it's a great way to get his range of motion back and his, uh, um, strength back. I think I answered all these. I'm pretty sure. It looks like I'm kind of caught up. Uh, uh, Gregoris, that's a great, uh, can we use BFR for the late maturation child in order to increase its disadvantage in strength? Yeah, I, um, 
I mean, the current recommendation is nothing less than 15 years of age. Um, I would I would co-manage that with somebody. I mean, late maturation. So we if we're you know with a guy or girl, they they should be over 15. As long as they're over 15, I don't see any contraindication to that. I haven't done it personally though, so I'm not sure. Then for those of your session medically astute, you may want to suggest the podcast. Yeah, that's a good idea. I did do a podcast with Dr. Mercola where we get kind of deeper dive into the uh, mechanisms and other things a little bit. I, I wanted to stay away from a lot of that. I wanted to give you enough to make it interesting, but not bombard with jargon and science and all that stuff. Next week's class that I do on Thursday will be, I'm going to incorporate a lot more of the science. Um, Lynn, from another viewer, are bilateral cuffs needed for cardio benefit? I think so. Um, one study looking at walking, we didn't get a lot of metabolite accumulation. So here's where I think we get the, the, the uh, cardiovascular benefit. Um, and again, if you talk, if you go on that podcast with Dr. Mercola, cardiac output, the amount of flow coming out of my heart is a, is a product of two things, heart rate, the amount of times my heart is beating and stroke volume, heart rate times stroke volume is equal to cardiac output. When I have two cuffs on, I am basically reducing blood flow from that cuff above. I'm cutting off venous return, remember, from our definition venous occlusion is totally occluded. So if I reduce the stroke volume, my heart rate has to go elevated. And so I think if you only use one cuff, you're not going to see nearly the adaptation that if you're using two cuffs. If there's a contraindication, one cuff is better than no cuffs. A little exercise is better than no exercise. And so I think you have to um, take that kind of in mind, I guess. Lynn asked, do you use any biofeedback equipment while exercising with BFR? Sometimes I use a, um, sometimes I use an ultrasound uh, to look at um, contraction, uh, especially with multifidi. I'm a multifidi geek. Um, I'm trying to think if I use any other biofeedback mechanism. No, not really, because we know from the science that we get type two activation, and I'm really you, you, for, for, I don't want to get too deep down into this, but when we fatigue, one of the other benefits of BFR, one of the mechanisms is early fatigue. So because we're making a hypoxic environment, the type one fibers hate it because type one fibers are dependent on oxygen. They fatigue early. What we know is when lactate increases, we get higher EMG. So we fatigue pre type one fibers, then what has to happen is type two fibers have to take over to continue the exercising. I have a slide on this. Um, and so let me share that. Um, Milos, how much do we need to follow skin color changes? I don't think you need to follow it at all. Use your seven and eight out of 10 um, com uh, discomfort. Do you have any experience using BFR with incompletes? Uh, Tammy, yes, I do. I'm currently coaching somebody um, and I'm doing a presentation at NeuroCon at Parker in August about this. I, I should do, on my next BFR Tuesday, I will do something around this because we're seeing some nice changes with um, BFR and size and strength. Um, and there was a study by Gorgi, sorry, my brain's starting to get a little fried, um, 2017, looking at incomplete and had a nice adaptation with grip strength. Okay, let's see, let me go back to my share. Let me go through the rest of these slides because I know I only had reserved 90 minutes of your time and now we're at 100 minutes and I don't wanna be disrespectful. Um, so cuff comparisons, let's see. So again, you can look at kind of this. This is kind of just a, uh, a listing, but mostly you'll see here, being able to um, detach the hose is important to us, be able to train outside and in a pool. Made in the USA is important to us. Um, the width of the cuff is important. FDA listed is important. That's why these are all falling under smart cuffs. Owens Recovery is a great product, um, an amazing product. It's just very expensive. Um, I have 350 to 1500, but it's actually way more expensive than that. It's, um, I think it's almost 6,000. And you only get one cuff with that. 
Um, Be Strong makes a nice product, but they have a diaph- they have a um, they have a uh, diaphragm that's segmented. So I don't think you get the metabolism contract that contraction. And the Katsu system is a nice system, just very very narrow, and I don't think nearly as comfortable. And that's what a lot of people tell us as well. You do get, um, and I'll send this link. If anybody would like to purchase, there are um, clinical sets available, and I can get you a 10% educational discount if you use my um, my coupon code. You just go to smarttoolsplus.com. We also have a personal set. This would be perfect for at home. Two cups for the upper extremity, two cups for the lower extremity, and then we have a basic set. You can you can purchase two of the same or one for the upper one for the lower. Um, that's 10% off as well. Next week, I'm gonna be talking about BFR home programming. I am gonna charge for this one just because this takes a lot of time and uh, clinic is closed and um, you know, you get it. Um, so home exercise programming, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna give you a four week aerobic and resistance training protocol, uh, research to support my programming and uh, the waiver that I use in the clinic. And I can probably be convinced of some other goodies um, here again is my contact information, but I'm going to go through really quick and um, just show these two mechanisms just because I got the question. Here is your type two recruitment. And again, this is going back to biofeedback. The reason we use biofeedback is we want to make sure that we're recruiting the motor units in order to get um, contraction. So this is a really great slide. This is from Dr. Jesse's um, mechanism overview in 2018. Here is the cuff. Uh, blood flow is going back and um, uh, arterial flow is 100%. So we have 100% arterial flow, 100% venous return. What's happening is these type 1 fibers down here are getting fatigued. Once I inflate the cuff and I start continue exercise, now those metabolites have nowhere to go. Metabolite accumulates, lactate accumulates, lactate has been shown to increase EMG. That means that we're using more motor units in order to continue to exercise. We've reduced the amount of blood flow into that limb. Now we continue to exercise. Metabolite accumulation is really occurring. Blood flow is still reduced. And I've worn out all your type one fibers. Now I gotta start tapping into type two fibers. And if we can get to close to volitional failure, you're gonna tap out all those type two fibers as well. And type two fibers are the most um, type two fibers are the most adapt to grow and also to uh, get stronger compared to type one fibers. Let's see, I'm gonna stop my share. Uh, Vin wanted me to inflate the cuff. So I'm gonna take the cuff and I'm going to When I put this cuff on for personal use, <clears throat> I put it with the valve facing forward. So that way it's easy for me to inflate. Okay. Okay, so now I am going to attach I'm going to close the valve and I'm going to inflate this to the pressure that I've already determined on my LOP. So uh, in the upper extremity, I use 50% of my LOP. If it's your first time doing it, I would do 40% LOP. And then I'm going to do my, I'm going to detach the cuff and now I'm going to do 30 repetitions, 29, 30. I'm going to rest for 30 seconds. I'm then going to do 15 repetitions, 13, 14, 15, rest for 30 seconds. So then 15, rest for 30, 15, rest for 30, and then I'm gonna deflate. And I typically do these bilaterally. So hopefully then that helps. Okay, let's see. Man, I'm getting tired. So I'm going to just take a few more questions. If BFR is combined with instrument assisted, would it further enhance swelling? 
BFR, you mean, I'm um, not sure. I don't think so, not, not significantly. We do not deviate from a 75 rep range or thresh thereabouts while training with BFR. Mm, Charles, I don't like to say anything's absolute. Um, if my loads are too light, I'll continue having them train until they're getting close to that two or three rep volitional failure. Um, and on the converse side, if it's too heavy and they get close, then it is what it is. And then I know next time I just document and I'll know next time to, uh, you know, use um, either high, heavier weight or lighter weight. There's a lot of people that you go to failure. So, but that's okay, but I wouldn't do it as a first timer. I wouldn't do it sometime with somebody because it's going to take three or four days to recover, especially after the first three sessions. I would stick to the 75 as a nice framework and then work off of that. But no, it's, it's not an absolute. It's about getting people to failure and it, or close to failure or fatigue. And sometimes I just don't know the weight. I'm wrong with the weight. And so I've got to do a little bit more rep or I'm just, I just slightly um, overestimated. And so I got to reduce the rep. How soon after knee replacement? With no contraindications, you can pretty much, as long as the scar is not above two inches, you can pretty much start um, ASAP. Um, are there any added strength hypertrophy benefits to using muscle stim devices like compacts in order with BFR? Tyler, there is. We do passive, um, passive or isometrics uh, with uh, e-stim, and there are benefits. Also drives growth hormone and helps um, increase muscle protein synthesis, especially in a passive, meaning I just inflate the cuff and I don't even exercise. I'm just hanging out. You guys, I apologize for going 20 minutes over. I, um, I tend to not do this, but there were just so many great questions. Um, I really, really, really appreciate everybody coming on. Next week on Thursday, we'll send out a link when it's all ready. I'm gonna do a 30-day home programming with the research. Um, so hopefully I'll see you to attend that. Uh, or share this with anybody that you think that this was valuable with. Um, I'm gonna do another replay of this live tomorrow, and then we'll probably just use it as an educational um, from that point forward. If there's any way that I can make this more clear um, or improved or better, please uh, let me know. I don't take it, I mean, I do take it a little because I'm a little sensitive, but um, it does help me improve the, the um, presentation for next sessions. Um, if you could follow me on social media, it's helpful for me to, to build my audience so I can get this message out to more and more people. And um, otherwise, I appreciate you all. Um, stay safe in this time. Um, I know it's affecting most all of us, especially uh, just financially and psychologically and health-wise. We all know somebody that's been affected. Um, and so take care of yourself. Thank you so much, and um, I hope to see you soon.